We couldn't really do a MIDI video without having um, an old keyboard from the 80s and there's nothing more iconic I think from the 80s than the Yamaha DX7. It's uh, got those classic piano sounds and stuff. Uh, let me find an organ. There was a, a Hothessa classic. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're pretty awful sounds. Oh, and I'm the final countdown. Awful. Yeah, yeah. Or, or... <laughs> I'm not a keyboard player, but um, I think that was part of the advantage of MIDI is as someone that wasn't a great player and didn't know a lot about sounds, you could just worry about it later, fix it, change the sounds later on. So the scope was much more than, than with audio. But yeah, if the sounds were bad, then the sounds are bad. What can you do? MIDI was something that was designed in the early 80s. It came out in 1983, but there were earlier versions of it made by Roland, um, which kind of were the prototypes that became MIDI. And I'd say it's kind of analogous in some ways to like a compression algorithm. It's very loosely analogous. So instead of, say, having a bass drum that's recorded as an audio signal, so you've got a microphone inside the bass drum and you're Sort of playing the bass drum and it would take up a lot of back in those days I mean you weren't even really thinking about disk space because it wasn't uh, being recorded digitally but if it had have been it would have taken up a lot of disk space more than was possible to do what you could do is you could get one of the bass drums and say well all the bass drum sounds are basically the same thing what we'll do is we'll store that one sound and then play a note on a keyboard or play a note from a trigger or from a computer or something like that and it would play that sound over and over again and that was one of the many, many uses of MIDI. Uh, but it was the idea that you control your devices in the studio by little bits of information rather than containing the whole wave or whatever you want to do. So MIDI's an acronym, isn't it? It is, yeah. What? It stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. MIDI obviously ended up being used uh, with computers very, very early on. Um, Atari, uh, the ST model, and I think a lot of other models had uh, MIDI ports directly in on the side. And because they had a graphical environment, uh, Steinberg wrote um, Cubase, I believe it was still, it was Steinberg back then, they wrote a piece of software called Cubase, which was an early MIDI sequencer, which is still going today, uh, today as a full-blown audio and MIDI package. In fact, we'll probably end up using that a bit later. But um, back in those days, you could effectively create a whole composition on a computer and trigger off the sounds from various sound modules and samplers and whatever else and and it would produce these files that were maybe a couple of k in size but could have a whole arrangement which back in those days was was phenomenal so let's get into a bit more technical stuff in midi there's these things called channels so there's 16 channels which are from the user's point of view, numbered one to 16, but internally zero to 15 for obvious reasons. Um, and they basically, you could see a channel as, as a way of addressing different pieces of equipment. And there's also a mode called Omni, which means it would listen to all channels. So if you wanted to say, have a piece of equipment that had, that just did the piano, another piece of equipment that just did the drums, another one that just did the bass, you could set them to different channel numbers internally. You could go to their settings and say, I only want to listen to channel three on this particular piece of equipment. And then you could have different tracks within your MIDI sequencer um, that would only put that data to channel three and only put that data to channel one, let's say. Um, so you could have effectively one signal that would carry all the data for the entire song. This is like a one set of cabling that perhaps all connected to all of the equipment, would it be? Yeah, I mean, the way, I mean, there's, there's, there's all sorts of complicated ways of, of, of cabling up MIDI with distribution boxes, but the, the most simple way to do it would be to go out of your computer or your sequencer or whatever into your keyboard and then out of the keyboard, um, out of that one to the next one. I should mention at this point, the actual MIDI the look of MIDI cables. So, I mean, this is the back of a, a Focusrite um, stereo sound card here. 
So as you can see, the, the standard MIDI in and out are the five pin DIN sockets, uh, similar to the socket that was used on a tape machine to put programs into an old computer like uh, my old Acorn Electron or BBC. So we've linked all these machines together. So, so well, let, let's, let's strip it down because it's all very well to say there's 16 channels. As with anything, it's better to explain it simplified. Um, so let's forget the fact that there's 16 channels um, and just go with one channel. So let's say we've got a keyboard and a piano module and that's all we're dealing with. And there are five types of messages that you get um, that MIDI can transmit and receive. And the first of which, which is uh, probably the most used, are what's called the channel voice signals. And the channel voice signals are very similar to um, keyboard signals from a computer keyboard or anything else. And if you've ever done any programming um, or sort of dealt with anything, events in JavaScript or something like that, you'd know that there's sort of mouse down, mouse up events, key down, key, key up events. And you get the same thing with keyboards. So the channel voice settings will say, on channel one I'm going to send a note down and then a note up. So you can record the length of the time that the note was down. You can also, on some keyboards with aftertouch, say how much pressure, uh, how much pressure you're applying after the event. You can say how much pressure you initially touched it with, uh, the volume of the note, and a whole host of other things like the modulation wheel. And uh, you've then got after that uh, channel mode signals, which uh, I'm not going to go into, but they're just basics of like little reset signals and system signals and stuff like that. And then you've got what's called uh, system common messages, which are things that are sent to every device in the system. Um, so if you had a whole load of sound modules, it would send it to all of them. And then you've got system real-time signals, which are things like your time code and your clock, uh, all, all that kind of stuff. And then you've got what's called system exclusive signals, or SysX, as they're called for short, which is like the backup and restore, can be used for backup and restore functionality. So let's say you've got a sound module, um, and in that sound module you've got a load of different piano sounds, and you've tweaked these piano sounds to have a certain amount of sustain and whatever, and you want to save those settings you can use your audio sequencer or a piece of software to record the MIDI data out of that. And then when you dump the system exclusive data, it dumps that into your computer and then you can retrieve it back and, and, and restore all the settings on your, on your module. So it was a nice, easy way in the early 80s to back up and restore things. Um, amongst other things, each unit, that's the whole point of system exclusive. The, the stuff that that can do is exclusive to the individual unit. MIDI sounds like it's a very useful and kind of specialist application in, in studios. And, and is that, was that it? Is that what we're talking about? MIDI has been used that long because that's where it found its use? Well, it started like that, but no. I mean, it's, it's used all over the place. There was this thing that came out um, some a little bit of time after the MIDI spec came out called General MIDI, which kind of standardized what you should find on each channel. So for example, channel one would be a piano, channel 10 was for drums. And in the 80s and 90s, people who were playing computer games, particularly on early PCs, they would have had maybe a Sound Blaster card. And then that meant that, say, computer game manufacturers could put music along with their game, where they were recording the note information, again, keeping the file sizes really small, and then that would be fed into your sound card to create whatever fully sort of symphonic uh, piece of music you wanted in the background of the game. So if you had a really good sound card with really good sounds, the music on that game might sound really good. Um, and if you had a really cheap sound card, the music on that game could be really cheap. But the fundamentals behind it was still MIDI and uh, that was all over the place. Well, another thing that, that MIDI gets used for in this day and age, and I use it myself live when I'm gigging, is um, I have a foot controller, which is MIDI, and then it changes all the different sounds in my guitar rack. So if I'm on sound one and it's nice and clean, I hit on sound two and I can play a solo or whatever, um, it will change all the equipment and change which setting they're all on it and that's called a patch. It's a very easy way to just hit a pedal with your foot and have all your sounds change at the same time. And that's also true for keyboard players, you know, they'd be playing on a piano sound and then go to patch two and it suddenly becomes an organ. It might fire off patch changes in other, people, uh, in other pieces of equipment. And that's a, just a good example of a, of a control signal that's sent by MIDI. I can give you a demo of how a certain bit of MIDI works. We're just going to record something into the computer. So this is Cubase. This is uh, version 8, which is far advanced to the version that would have been on the Atari ST back in the early 80s. But 
fundamentally it does exactly the same thing. Rather than using the DX7 sounds, I'm going to use a very dated sound that's built into Cubase. So this is controlling the computer. So you can see if I play the notes on the keyboard, they light up on the side here. And let's say I'd played a, a note wrong. Heaven forbid I did that. So. Okay, so I've got the notes wrong there and I hit a little fumbled bit at the end. And I could double click on this and go, oh, there's a fumbled note there. So I can get rid of that. And I can move these notes to where they should be. And then I could play that back and it should be fixed. which uh, still sounds bad, but is uh, infinitely better than it was before when it was on the wrong note. So you can see the data's getting in and the data's being stored in the computer as messages of note on and note off. And the color here, represented with these bars at the bottom as well, represent the volume that I played the note at. On the technical side, so obviously we're seeing a bit of kind of user end data here. What does the message look like? Right, well, we can get into that. That's uh, funny you say that. Um, the reason I... When I first started using MIDI, um, I was maybe about 13 or 14 at school and I was entirely from the user end. And then through my career working in the studio, I was using it entirely at a user end. And I didn't really think about how it worked. I just thought about the channels and the messages. I kind of knew what they meant, but I didn't really care about that too much. And then something came up where I was writing um, a video server application that needed to sync up with timecode. Um, so I had to write a time code reader. And in the process of doing that, I actually had to start intercepting the MIDI messages and looking into what they actually contained. Um, so I've modified that time code reader program that I wrote so that we can actually capture into a text file what's going on. So if I just play a note and then I let it go, so we should now just have one note on and one note off. So if I open up this MIDI output.txt, and we can see I played note 72 with a volume of 91. They're not actually 72 or 91. That is in hexadecimal. So whatever they are in, in decimal, um, that's what I played. And we got a note on signal there and another note on signal there, zero, which is denoting that it's a, a note off. Ignore the rest of it. This is actually what's called the MIDI clock. So it's telling me what the, uh, the number of the messages, because obviously messages come in and you want to make sure that the message that comes in is after the previous one and such. So that's, that's what that is there. The zero is the channel that it's on, which means it's actually on channel one, because obviously zero is channel one and 15 is channel 16, just to confuse everyone. Um, so we can capture some other things as well. So if I play a note again and then do the modulation wheel and then back down again and then let go of the note, you can now see I've got a new note on message there and then a load of control change information which is increasing one two three four five six seven nine it starts skipping it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it reaches the top it goes back down the other side back down to zero again so that is literally the recording of me pushing up the modulation wheel and bringing it back down again and that just makes it this is a technical term sound wibbly <laughs> it does. Well, the modulation wheel will do whatever the sound module is uh, is set there's also a, a pitch shift wheel which will make things you know, wee, wee, you know you sort of go up and down in pitch or whatever so uh, there's all these different controls there's panning so you can get things to go from left to right in the speakers and all of those things will be um, recorded by your MIDI sequencer and then reproduced. Okay and then you were mentioned before about kind of controlling and synchronizing things. That to me is a really good example of something that MIDI does well but also shows off kind of how archaic it is because you'd think with the technology in, in today's time, you could send a full clock, which will be hours, minutes, seconds, frames, all in one bit of data, not literally one bit of data, but, but in one chunk of data, and, um, and it should be able to just pick up on it in real time. But back in the day, that was too much data to send through in, in one piece. So it was broken up into lots of individual pieces that were constantly sent, and and this is the f this is the way I discovered it by having to write a timecode reader. So let me first show you timecode working right there. So right, yeah, I've just connected the MIDI out to this, 
and this here is connected to my laptop which is running uh, Reaper which is just an audio sequencer um, audio MIDI sequencer same as Cubase but um, it's only about 16 pounds so I suggest getting it so just here you can see that the time code is running if I stop that again and I run my time code reader software so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hit go on my laptop, which will start sending time code via MIDI to my desktop computer, which is going to be, and the signals are going to be recorded into the text file um, so we can have a look at them. Um, so here we go. I'll play a few seconds of this. And then what I'm going to do is jump this forward so it's a bit further in. So I'll go to there. And now we're at 10 minutes. And I'll record a bit of that, and then I'm going to hit stop on there and uh, we can have a look at the text file and see what it contains. I'll give you a breakdown of what all of these things mean. This here is the timestamp of the MIDI signal. So this here is the actual signal that's coming in. Four lots of 8-bit represented in hexadecimal. That first one, the F1, basically means that it's time code. That's okay. what that means, so we can ignore that. We can also ignore the last two because that doesn't contain anything that's useful to time code. So it's this second number here which I've actually split into its binary representation into two columns of four. And the reason I've done that is because the first column of four says what it is, what it's representing. So the zero, 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 zero represents the number of frames. But because you've only got four zeros to represent the number of frames, that can only be a value between naught and 15. And we know that when you're dealing with frames, are either in 24, 25, 30, 29.97, 30, call it 30. And obviously 30 can't be represented in 0 to 15. So the next signal there, which is 0, 0, 0, 1, gives you an offset. So if that ends with a 1, which is just 1, so if that becomes a 1, then basically you can kind of put that on before there, and that steps it up 16. And the same is true for the seconds because they're up to 60. The same is true for the minutes and the same is also true for the hours. So you've got eight bits that have to tell you what part of the, the time it is and that time. Yes, so, so basically you, you, you take the, four, the first four of the ones and zeros and say this is, uh, this is say hours or minutes or the offset, as I call it, the offset of the hours or the offset of the minutes. So the way um, a time code signal would work is basically you have eight different signals that come in and they all contain a little bit of the time. So let's start with um, the first signal to come in. That will be 0, 0, 0, 0, which will be the number of frames. And then 0, 0, 0, 1 which will be called the offset for frames. So the second bunch of four will be the frame number. So let's say it was frame number two. That's going to be 0010, because obviously it's one, two, four, eight in the columns. Then your offset frames would be 0000. zero, zero, zero. But if you wanted it to be frame 18, you'd actually change that to a 1, so that would be 0, 0, 0, 1 in the offset frames, which would say, ah, your first signal isn't 2, because that effectively gets moved up to there, and becomes 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, which would be 18. But that's sent in two separate messages. The same is true for minutes, uh, seconds, hours, whatever. So to, to send a whole time... Yeah, it requires eight messages. This is a good representation of something which is very, very solid and works really well. And clearly it works well because it is everywhere, whether you're working with syncing up sequences in audio or whether you're syncing up a video server to you know, a band that's playing and you want the videos to appear exactly the same time. The band might be playing to a click track and the lighting desk might turn all the lights on at that exact moment in the show. So, I mean, it's used to do all of that. So, and it's very solid and it works almost perfectly. Um, you know, unless you get someone pulls a cable out, which happens and then it all goes wrong. Um, but it's also very archaic. You can see with this sort of split message system that seems to be going on. You do have, um, in MIDI, you do have things that are uh, long messages and short messages. And it takes up eight short messages to produce a full piece of time code. Uh, when you hit go initially, 
it actually sends a long message through, which does contain the entire timecode, but I'd imagine you can't send as many of them, and it's inefficient to send as many of them, because you, you don't need to know that. Once you've got a full time and you're going, you can then update the seconds and the, the frames. You don't really need to update the whole time, so they're sending it through in chunks. So I'd imagine a lot of it was written with you know, the computing power of the time in mind and obviously they wanted it to be compatible with most computers which is why they chose it to run at one megahertz. As a musician and uh, any other musician should know this, D minor is of course the uh, saddest of all keys and I thought what is sadder than, uh, than the piece of software that the D minor chord is going to open now. This is an example of application of MIDI for something that's totally useless but when I play a D minor Oh, there's Internet Explorer. <laughs> Bing. Is this yours, this keyboard? Uh, no, it's uh, this keyboard I borrowed from my old um, GCSE and A-level physics teacher, uh, Phil Cummins, who was uh, one of the cooler teachers at school because he played keyboards in a band. But there's something about a Yamaha DX7 which just conjures up 80s sounds, yeah. It's just got that sound of... Oh, oh, Internet Explorer's opened again. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> I just like playing Phil Collins and Internet Explorer open.